Hi, I'm Alistair. I'm a games designer. And normally in these videos, I would describe how you can create an electronic puzzle suitable for use in an escape room. Now, unfortunately, here in the UK at least, all escape rooms are still currently closed under coronavirus lockdown, and it looks like that might continue for a while yet. However, we have been having beautifully sunny, warm weather, and as a result, some escape room designers have been turning their attention to creating outdoor experiences instead. Um, not just to get the benefit of the nice weather, but also it means it's possible to create an experience outdoors where you have lots of players involved, but still maintaining social distance. So this tutorial is about how to create uh, this puzzle, which is inspired by that. So on the board here, I've got an Arduino, a battery pack, an LCD display, uh, a buzzer, and crucially, a GPS module at the top here, because this is going to be a location-based puzzle. Now, you may be familiar with uh, scavenger hunts or geocaching, where players are given the latitude and longitude coordinates of a real-world location, and they need to go there, perhaps following an app on their phone, and when they get there, there's normally an object they have to find. Sometimes that might be a, a statue that has an inscription on it they have to read, and the inscription will give them a, a clue for the next puzzle, sometimes like that. But the point with those examples is normally the object is in a fixed place and the players are given clues as to its location. Well, uh, this puzzle is kind of that turned on its head uh, because I've placed these components inside a box here. So this is exactly the same as this. Um, but what I've also put here is a mag lock, which is securing the box closed. And this is obviously a, a portable device. And rather than players being given the location of a fixed physical object. In this puzzle, what they have to do is they have to carry this box to the location which they're given clues on the display here. So I'm printing out uh, the current latitude and longitude and also saying how far the distance is away from the target location. By moving around and recording that value at different places, uh, players can effectively triangulate where they're trying to get to and when the uh, GPS in the box detects that it is arrived at the target location, what happens is the mag lock is released, the box is opened, and players can access uh, whatever is contained inside, which might be the clue to the next location. So let me show you how it works. But before we can do that, we need to define the target location where we want players to have to take the box to. And particularly, I need to know the latitude and longitude coordinates of that position. So to get those, I've come to openstreetmap.org. Um, you can use Google Maps as well. And I'm just going to find a, a location, which is a kind of a wooded location where I often walk my dog. Uh, so that is down here. You can see we've got a wooded area here with a footpath through it. And if I zoom in far enough, you'll see that about halfway through this path, there's a bench and a bin. Now, if I right click at this point and just put show address, you'll see that I can actually get the coordinates of that location there. So I'm simply going to select those and copy them into the top of the Arduino code here, where we've got target latitude and target longitude. And then having done that, we're all ready to compile and upload the code onto the board and then we're ready to take the puzzle box and the dog for a walk. So I've come out to a spot near the target location. Um, now, unfortunately, I've lost the dog already. She's chasing a rabbit in the undergrowth there somewhere. Uh, but I do have my box. So if I turn it on and we'll just wait while it gets a GPS fix on our location. So we see a little message here with the dots going up. Uh, so there we go, that's our latitude and longitude and the distance remaining to the target. So we've got about 125 metres to go and we'll set off. So I've come a short way down the path and you can see that the distance remaining has decreased. So we know we're going in the right direction, uh, 109 metres left to go. A little bit further on, we're down to 96 metres left. Uh, no, 
if you can make that out in this glorious sunshine. That's 76 metres remaining. Uh, and now as we just round this corner, I'm just going to slow down a bit because we've only got 47 metres left to go. And um, if you recall, the target location I set to be a bench, which I uh, viewed on Open Street Maps. And if you look in the distance there, you can actually see it. It's 35 metres away now. Now, uh, I also programmed a proximity in the code of 10 metres. So when I get within 10 metres of that bench, um, it is going to be determined to be on site. So I'm just going to slow down. This last little bit, I'm just going to hold the side of the box up. So you can see it pop open there when I get to the bench it says congratulations treasure found and then if I just set the box down here I'll open it up so the maglock is now released meaning that I can open the box up there and you can see all of the components inside okay so let me give you a little bit more information about the components I'm using in the box and in fact this brings me on to my first point to note which is that okay now I've brought the box back here I'm no longer in the target location so how am I going to open up the maglock to show you what's inside and the uh, solution to that is this little hole which I've drilled on the side of the box here um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small screwdriver and insert it into that hole and when I do so you'll see the box pop up so um, just to explain what I've done there, we've got the maglock mounted in this corner here and the hole on the side here, uh, what it does is it just triggers the maglock release. So here I've got a maglock knot in the box and uh, when you poke the screwdriver in, what I'm doing is I'm hitting this just capped at the bottom here and that is what releases the maglock. So obviously whenever you are um, building something like this that is potentially secured shut, you need to give yourself some backdoor way in to be able to open it again. In my case, I'm using a purely mechanical uh, solution, which is to tap that there. It is also possible if you wanted to um, take these wires and expose them to a jack on the outside that you could apply power to that would force the maglock open. That's a bit risky as well though, because if the maglock actually burns out, um, that's still not going to work. So I like the, the purely mechanical solution um, with the little hole in the box that you just poke the screwdriver into. That always works for me. Um, and then uh, inside here, so I've got the, the components that I described earlier. Um, it's got the relay here going to the maglock, the battery pack. Uh, now just to talk about this a little bit. so. The uh, GPS module itself draws a reasonable amount of uh, current. So I didn't want to just power it from um, AA batteries or from a nine volt cell battery or something like that. So I'm using a LiPo battery like this. Um, this is a similar style of battery to you might find in uh, a laptop battery or a radio controlled drone or something like that. So it is capable of supplying higher current values that's a 12 volt battery so uh, 12 volts is going direct to the maglock and then i'm going via a 5 volt step down to all the components on the top here um, the other thing i just wanted to mention in more detail is the aerial for the gps that's this uh, little unit in the corner here um, now when i bought these gps units they came supplied with a, a kind of a tiny little ceramic aerial like that um, and I found that that didn't really um, get very good reception. It took a very long time to get a GPS fix in the first place. And then it sometimes lost it if I was uh, under coverage of trees or inside something like that. Uh, I then initially replaced it with uh, one of these. Instead, this is a GPS antenna sold for use in car uh, GPS systems and things like that. So I thought, well, that would be pretty good. But actually, I found that I didn't really get that good performance with that either. The, the best performance I've had is still with a ceramic antenna. So similar to the one, I'm oh sorry, that's there. Similar to the one that came with the GPS module, but it has a much larger area and it just has a metal plate on the back. And with this, what I find is that I can get an initial GPS fix. So the first time you power this all on, 
it might take up to about a minute to get a fix on the location. But once you've done that once, what you'll see is that the uh, GPS module actually has a little battery uh, just there, a tiny little battery, and it will save the last known location where it got a fix. What that means is that the next time you boot it up, it will kind of uh, start from that location for its next scan. And the, the follow-up scans will be much, much faster. So using this aerial here, um, I can now get a fix within a few seconds normally of turning the box on. And actually what I was really surprised by is that, um, as you'll see on this one here, I can even get a fix when I'm inside. Um, so I was actually I'm not expecting this to work indoors um, at all. I thought I would have to be outdoors for this puzzle. And I was designing it to be an outdoor puzzle, but I was kind of pleasantly surprised to find that actually um, I can get a perfectly good reading when I'm using it indoors as well. And here's a diagram of how the components are all wired together, which hopefully makes it a, a little bit clearer to see what's going on. So starting at the bottom with the battery pack here. So I've got a 12 volt battery pack and you can see that the first thing that happens to the positive line coming out, this red one here, is it goes to a switch. Now this is going to act as an isolation switch for the power supply to all the other components in the circuit. So when this is off, uh, nothing is going to receive any power at all because it's uh, broken this positive supply line here. Uh, when the switch is on, uh, what happens next is that the power is effectively split into two different sort of sub-circuits. Now if we follow the left-hand branch to start with, you can see that the 12 volt line we've got coming in here goes to the common terminal in the middle of a relay. And then we've got the normally open side of that relay going to a 12 volt maglock. Um, We've also got the negative side of the maglock here, the black line, wired straight down to the battery pack as well. So what we've got here is a, a circuit that has got the 12 volts from the battery going to the maglock, and it's broken only by the relay here. So because we're going into the normally open connection, uh, when the uh, relay is off, when it's in its default state, uh, no power is going to the maglock at all because this is an open connection. When the relay is energized, however, which it can be when controlled by the Arduino here, uh, what's going to happen is that the common pin in the middle is going to flick across and get connected to the normally open pin. This will make a closed circuit on this side and 12 volts of power will be able to flow from the battery into the maglock. That's going to eject the catch. Um, so this is effectively one circuit on its own and that is all running at 12 volts. If we follow the right hand side though, what happens here is that we uh, take a positive and the ground line from the battery and these go into a little adapter. This is a, a buck converter that converts the 12 volt power down to 5 volts required by the Arduino. Now, the reason I've included this, you um, may be aware that Arduinos have a V-in pin here. And that allows you to provide a voltage of between, I think it's 6 and 12 volts on a nano. Um, and that goes through the, the sort of the onboard regulator. If you're using an Uno, uh, you'll also be aware that it has a, a DC barrel jack that you can plug in higher voltage to. But if you do that, the onboard regulator on the Arduino is having to do all of the work of uh, converting down this 12 volt supply down to 5 volt. So it's trying to dissipate all that extra unwanted power through heat. It gets very hot and also it's not actually capable of supplying a very high current. I think it's uh, limited to 500 milliamps of current. Now the, uh, the GPS module itself particularly has a fairly high demand uh, for current. Um, the LCD has a slight demand and, and the relay a little bit as well. So rather than put all of that demand onto the regulator on the Arduino itself, what we're effectively doing is introducing an external um, regulator that's going to do that hard work for us. That's going to ease the Arduino regulator, which is only a little thing, and it's just going to, to make it 
more within the tolerance limits of, of all these uh, devices. That's that's why we're doing that. Okay, so that we've got this uh, stepping down our 12 volt supply here into a 5 volt supply that is going to be used by these other components here. So we've got um, on this side a 5 volt relay module. So this is going to the 5 volt supply and to ground and we have a signal line here which we've got going into pin D4. Now this is a 5 volt relay module and I know that um, sometimes this can cause some confusion because what this module is doing is this is switching on this side the 12 volts that's going to the maglock but we still refer to it as a 5 volt relay module because it's actually using 5 volts of power to energize the relay on this side the, the the trigger signal on this side and all the logic that actually controls it is at 5 volts so that's why we refer to it as a 5 volt relay module even though it's actually controlling our 12 volt DC supply on this side um, so that's our relay here here we've got at the top our um, the GPS module the sort of the the brains of this entire project really that also has a 5 volt and a ground supply and it has a transmit and receive line as well. Um, now the Altsoft serial library I'm using has particular pins that it has to use. So uh, you have to use pin 9 for transmit and pin 8 for receive. Um, obviously they are then the reverse when you connect them to the GPS module because the transmit from the GPS is going to become the receive on the Arduino so that goes to 8 and the transmit of the Arduino uh, on D9 goes to the receive of the GPS. Do be a little bit careful because I've seen uh, different forms of this breakout board that have the pins in slightly different orders so don't necessarily rely on the colour order I've shown here. Um, do check the the actual pin labels that you've got as to which one is VCC ground transmit and receive so you want transmit uh, going to D8 because that's the receive pin on the Arduino and you want the receive here to go to D9 because that's the transmit pin on the Arduino and then on this side we've got our a display so we've got uh, ground 5 volts again just as all the other 5 volt devices here and here, as I um, mentioned, we're using an I2C backpack. So this display, uh, you'll see all these pins across the top here. And uh, kind of the raw way of interfacing with the display is actually uses something like kind of 15 pins. Well, we don't want to use that, though. If you have an I2C backpack on the back, you just need to use two pins, which is way easier. So um, again, the way that that is defined in the Arduino, you have to use particular pins to use that. Uh, A5 is always the clock pin in an I2C interface, and A4 is the data pin. So you might find these labelled as uh, SCL and SDA, or you might find them labelled as CLK and DAT, but this one is the clock line, and this is the data line. And then we've got 5 volts and ground there. Now, um, you could add other changes to this thing as you want. So like I say, I'm using a relay module, but if you wanted to use uh, you know, a piezo buzzer on this side instead, I'm using a, a missile switch, but perhaps you want that to be a, a momentary push switch instead so that players actually have to keep the button held down to get the, uh, the location reading from the GPS module. Um, there's various changes you can make, but that in essence is the core layout which I'm using. So here we've got the complete code listing for the sketch that's running on the Arduino. Uh, it's a little under 200 lines long, um, but I'm going to step through it and particularly sort of draw attention to the key points as we go through. So to start off with, I define a flag called debug. Um, if you've seen my previous projects, you'll know that this is a common pattern I use. Essentially what this lets me do is it, it lets me include sections of code later on that are only executed if that debug flag is set. So we've got some uh, statements there which are wrapped in this if def debug and then end if. We've got some more here and we'll have some more later on. And this is uh, essentially a way of writing conditional code blocks that 
while this statement is true at the top will get executed. If you delete that statement or if you comment it out like that, those statements later on won't get executed at all. So it's a handy way of uh, including blocks in your code. Like I say, these particularly are used for debugging purposes. So they'll output extra information to the Arduino or serial monitor, which will give you, uh, you know, useful assistance in working out if everything's working correctly. And when you're happy that it's doing so, you can comment that out and it will save those lines of code from running, which will make your program a little bit more efficient uh, when they're not required anymore. So that's my defines. Then we get a section of includes. So this is where we're making use of some external libraries outside of the code written here. And I'm using a handful of libraries here. So the GPS uh, module itself, we communicate with that via a serial connection. So it has a, a simple two-wire interface, a transmit and receive. And to create that serial interface, we're going to use the Altsoft serial library. Now there's a library that comes with the Arduino ID called Soft Serial, um, but that is not a great library. It's quite slow, it's known to be a bit buggy. Um, so this is a more reliable and more performant alternative. Um, the limitation of it is that it does force you to use particular pins on the Arduino for transmit and receive. But so long as you're um, you know, not limited in your pin choice, there's no reason not to use this library instead. So I'm using that for the, the software serial connection to the GPS. Uh, then this uh, tiny GPS plus library, this is going to expose some functions that are useful for dealing with the GPS data itself. So the serial connection here will allow us to retrieve in plain text format uh, the GPS messages that we get sent. And they're in a format that's called NMEA. But it's a little bit hard to uh, kind of pass the latitude and longitude values directly out of that. So using this library here, that's going to help make it easier to extract our current position from the data we get from the GPS monitor uh, over this link here. Now, the uh, LCD display which I'm using, uh, that has a I2C interface or an I squared C interface. So to connect to that, we're first of all going to include the wire library that comes with uh, the Arduino itself. Um, it's a very commonly used library uh, to connect to any kind of device that uses an I2C interface. And then again, we have a specific library for the type of display I'm using. So this uses this PCF8574 driver chip on the back. Um, so that's going to provide some, some handy functions for just displaying characters, strings, numbers on the display. So uh, that's all of the libraries we're making use of. Then we go on to the constant section. So constants are things that are not going to change throughout the duration of the code. And the first one is the target location which you saw me set earlier. So these are the values which are retrieved from OpenStreetMap. Here's the latitude and here's the longitude. And we also define a uh, constant called target proximity. So this is how close in meters the uh, recorded position that is, is currently being recorded by the GPS has to be to this location to uh, count as being within range, basically. So obviously, position is not an absolutely exact value anyway, and you'll get a little bit of noise in the sensor. So I've set a, a proximity of 10 meters. And I think that's, that's pretty good enough in open space to know that the player has definitely reached their target location. If you're trying to direct them to a, a building or something like that, which has obviously got quite a large volume itself, you want to set this value much higher um, just to ensure that they are within the, the location. If you're trying to direct them to a very specific spot um, you know, that has a, an item hidden on the ground, let's say you want to make this a smaller value. And then we also define a pin. This is the pin that I've got uh, the relay module connected to. So this is connected to the signal line on the relay and that's what we're going to use to open the lock when the target location is reached. Then we get onto our global section. So the globals, these are variables which are shared among several functions throughout the code. 
and we declare an object for the LCD display. Uh, like I say, it uses an I2C interface and every uh, component that's on an I2C bus has to have a unique address. That's set by the manufacturer normally. And uh, for my LCD display, that address is written here. You might also want to use um, this address instead, or if you've got a data sheet that came with your LCD display, it should say on it what the unique ITC address is that you're using. Uh, but these are two common values for LCD displays, so I would start with trying one of those two first. Um, we'll also create an object um, that from the tiny GPS plus library, that's what's going to help us pass that GPS data. And we'll create an object from the Altsoft serial library. So from three of the libraries that we included at the top, they gave us access to certain functions. And now we're actually creating objects from those libraries that are going to kind of create a way into use those functions. That's what we're doing here. Then we get into the setup. So setup runs once when the program first loads. Um, and the first thing we've got in setup is one of these conditional code blocks. So we're only going to execute this section here when the debug flag at the top has been included in the code here. So the reason for that is because, well, this is all uh, to do with setting up a serial connection. Uh, and that serial connection is only going to be useful if you've actually got a device on the other end receiving and uh, printing these messages. So normally that would be the Arduino IDE uh, when you are testing and running this connected to your PC. When it's actually uh, in production located in the puzzle box there isn't going to be anything that's capable of receiving these serial messages so there's no point running them. That's why we uh, include it in these little debug statements here. So we create a serial connection at 9600 board and we just uh, enter some uh, messages onto the screen so that we know what's happening in the setup function. Here we've got some uh, sections to initialize the LCD display. So uh, LCD begin uh, specifies the type of LCD we're using and R1 has 16 columns and two rows. Uh, we set the value of the backlight, so 255 is maximum brightness on the backlight. Because this is a puzzle that's designed to be used outdoors, uh, you might want to try tweaking that value. What I found is that different LCD displays have different uh, kind of reflectivity. Some of them reflect sunlight quite well on the front. Others need the backlight on even when you're in daylight. Um, so you can, might just want to try tweaking that value a bit if you can't easily see the readout on your LCD. And then we'll just wait for a tenth of a second and what we'll do is lcd.home so that kind of moves the cursor up to the the first line and the first character of the lcd and we'll print a little message we'll print the title of the puzzle then we'll move to the second line down uh, so this is the second row and the first character in the second row and we'll just print a little version number and wait a tenth of a second again once we got this far, we'll just update our serial monitor to say, OK, we've, we've done initialising the LCD display. Now let's move on to the GPS. And at this section here, we begin a software serial connection. So up here, we were using a hardware serial connection. This is the, uh, if you're on an Arduino Uno or a Nano, there is a single serial interface on those boards. Um, and that is what you're using when you use the USB connector to upload a sketch or when you're using it to monitor the progress of a sketch you're using the onboard hardware serial connection. Now we also want to set up a serial connection to the GPS module but we've already used up our single hardware connection so instead we're going to emulate a software serial connection and that's what we're going to do here. So we'll begin again 9600 board rate which is the speed at which the GPS module sends uh, information. So that's what we'll do there. Uh, and then what we will do next is to configure the pin which we are going to use to control the relay. So we'll set that as an output pin and initially at least we'll have a low signal written to that. Uh, when the puzzle is uh, triggered later when it's solved we will set a high signal there instead. So that's the end of the setup function everything's been initialized. 
We then move on to the main program loop. So this will loop over and over continuously uh, while the puzzle is still active and the, the on switch is in the on position. So the first thing we do is we uh, inquire from the GPS module. So that value that we uh, initialized at the top up here. So this goes to the tiny GPS library and it says, OK, have we received a valid location in the last stream of data that we received from the GPS? Uh, and if we did, we'll enter this block below it. So, OK, what will we do then? So the next thing I wanted to do was to, OK, let's print out the latitude and the longitude of the location where the GPS records that we currently are. Now, normally you could do that using uh, the printf function. But uh, there's a little bit of uh, complication here because the, the Arduino printf function doesn't support floating point numeric values. And that is how the latitude and longitude is stored in this location object here. So uh, there's a little bit of extra kind of fiddliness having to go on here. What we're going to do first is we're going to define two character strings, one called latitude and one called longitude. And they're both going to be eight uh, char uh, arrays and then we're going to use a function called d to str f and that's going to convert our floating point numeric values into these string values instead so we'll take the latitude here uh, we'll have a width of seven including four decimal places and we'll store that in the latitude value here and then we'll do exactly the same for the long member here and we'll store that in longitude now you'll notice that um, these were defined as eight character arrays, but here I'm only taking a width of seven. Um, that's because we need to leave one character free at the end for a terminating um, new line character, a, a null character at the end, so that Arduino knows that the string has finished. So that's deliberate there that we've got an eight here, but one character less here to leave room for a, a terminating uh, stop at the end. Okay, so now we've got um, string versions of the latitude and longitude that we received in our valid location. So what we're going to do is we're going to print them out to the LCD. So that's what we'll do in the next section. So now we'll create a, another character array. This one is 16 characters long and that's because our LCD display is able to fit 16 characters on a line. So this represents every one of the characters in one of the lines of the display. We'll use memset first of all. This sets uh, this array here to zero. So we're going to set the complete contents of line to zero. And we're going to do that for the complete, uh, every value in line is going to be zero. And then we will print the latitude, then the longitude, uh, which we've got here, into the line character array using SNPrintf. Now, if you're not uh, an Arduino programmer or if you're not that familiar with C, I've used a couple of functions here which might um, look unfamiliar to you. We've got D to strut F here. We've also got SNPrintf here. And if you're used to kind of higher level programming languages, this might seem a bit complicated. This is all to do with converting data between different data types. Essentially, instead of having a number that looks like 52.26, we've got a string value of 52.26. Um, and that in itself is actually made up a lot of individual chars, which are bytes. And so this is a little bit of, uh, this may seem a little bit complicated kind of moving it around, but this is because uh, Arduino C is actually a pretty low level language. So you need to kind of work at the level of individual um, elements of data and that's what we're doing here so don't worry too much about that what we're doing first of all so we've got some floating point values we convert them first of all to separate string characters array and then we actually combine those character arrays into a new character array that's going to represent all the values on the top line of the display and then we actually send that to the LCD so we clear the LCD go home so we go to the first position on the first line and we print the line that we just generated in this line here. Uh, so that's the top line of the display. What we're now going to do is to work out, well, how far have we still got to go to get to our target location? Well, fortunately, the tiny GPS Plus library includes 
a very handy utility function called distance between. So what we do there is we pass in our current latitude and our current longitude and then we also pass in the latitude and longitude of our target location here and what we get back is we get a unsigned long integer value called distance to target. Uh, so that's what we're going to write on the second line down of our display. So we'll clear out any value that's currently in the line character. So that was our first line. And then we will use smprintf again. And this time we'll copy uh, percent %ldm to go. So what this means here is this percent %ld here, this is a placeholder to say, OK, insert a long decimal value into this text string here. Well, what long decimal value do we want? We want the distance to target here. So let's say that dist to target that was returned by this function here. Let's say that was the value, I don't know, 500. What this line here will do, this will create a sentence, basically, a string that says 500 and then m to go, so 500 meters to go. If you wanted to, uh, you know, change the message that was inserted there, you could type anything you want, so long as it fitted within 16 characters of the display. You could even do a conditional switch statement here that varied depending on the distance. So let's say uh, on the next line down, we could have wrote something like if uh, dist to target greater than 1000, you could write something like, you know, oh, you long, long way to go yet or something like that. Uh, or if it was less than 100, you could write, you know, nearly there, keep going, something like that. So you could write a whole series of conditional statements here that uh, change this text if you want. But for the time being, I've just put a, a straightforward value that just says the number of meters to get. And then we'll write that onto the second line of the LCD like that. Um, now, the next section here, okay, so we've printed where we are, that was in this bit here. We've also printed how far we've got to go, that was in this section here. What we now need to do is actually apply the logic that says, well, hang on, have we actually reached our location yet? Uh, so that is all in this section of code here. So this is a very simple test, what we do is we look at the disk to target that we calculated in this section here, uh, there, and we compare it to the target proximity, which was, you'll remember, a constant that we defined at the top of the code here. And if the distance remaining is within the acceptable proximity of the target, then we're going to say, okay, we've reached our destination. So Again, we can define a new message that we want to print on the screen here. So we'll clear the LCD display. We'll go onto the first line and we'll print congratulations on the top line. And then we'll go onto the second line and we'll just say treasure found or whatever it is you want to uh, tell the player when they have arrived. And this is where we then perform the, uh, the action that we want the players to do. So it's all very well having a digital readout, and I think that can certainly be part of the solution. But I think what's nice about this puzzle is that it uh, is very physical, and it actually has a, a physical element to it. Otherwise, you could be playing this entirely on your mobile phone. So we can play a sound if you've got a buzzer attached to pin 4, for example. Or this is how we release the maglock. So um, we set the relay pen to high, so this is going to send a high signal. That's going to connect power to the maglock, and that is going to eject the catch from it, uh, releasing the catch and opening the lock. And then we're going to introduce a short delay, so it's just going to be like a, a hundred, uh, sorry, a tenth of a second we're going to set that pin high to, and then we're going to set it back to low again. This was the default state with it. The important thing if you're using a, a fail secure relay, you mustn't continuously supply power to them. You really just want this to be a, a brief pulse of power just for a tenth of a second and then we'll turn it off again. Uh, and then we wait for uh, just two seconds before we next check again. So uh, if the player leaves the location and returns to it, uh, this will get executed again so long as it's more than two seconds later. 
Now you'll notice here, um, I haven't called delay 100 or delay 2000. I've called something called non-blocking delay instead. And that's a function which is actually defined uh, at the bottom of the code here. So the problem with using delay in Arduino code, and you may be familiar with this from other projects, is it basically stops everything from running for the set amount of time. And, you know, that means that it blocks user input, it blocks any kind of LED flashing cycles, it blocks everything else that, that might be going on, which is often not what you really want. Um, in this case, the reason why I've inserted a, de a delay up here, for example, is to ensure that the message stays on the screen for long enough for the players to be able to see it. But in that time, our GPS module is still receiving new data, for example. And if we don't do something with that data that arrives, we might risk getting a kind of a buffer overflow situation or something like that. So even though we kind of want to pause this section of the code and let the player read the message that's appeared, we want to ensure that everything else behind the scenes is carrying on running as normal, that we're still processing uh, the GPS signal and, and everything else. So we call this non-blocking delay instead. And this is quite a, a straightforward function, really. You pass it the length of time that you want the code to wait for. And when it starts up, it looks at what the current time is. So millis will return the timestamp uh, how long the code has already been running for. And then what, what it will do is it will simply um, repeat this section of code here while millis is less than the start time um, compared to the number of milliseconds you wanted to wait for. So while the current time is less than the start time, uh, mo sorry, while the current time is minus the start time is less than the amount of time that you wanted to wait for. So basically wait for this amount of time. But instead of doing nothing, what we'll actually do is we will continue to read the incoming messages from the GPS. So this is like a delay uh, in terms of the LCD here, because we're not going to process any of this again, but we are still processing those uh, incoming messages. That's going to ensure that we get the most up-to-date data, uh, that we don't miss any GPS signals, and that we don't experience some kind of buffer overflow when these messages keep on arriving from the GPS module, but we're not doing anything with them. Uh, so that's the, that's the reason for that delay there. And then we finally we move on to the, the last section of the um, main program loop. So we're in this else section here. Now just to remind you, uh, this else relates to this if at the top here. So this whole section of code we've been looking at so far in the loop section, this only applies if we've received a valid uh, location fix from the GPS module. This section here gets executed if we haven't got a valid location. So uh, if for whatever reason we haven't got a location fixed yet, we'll enter here. So we'll clear the LCD and we'll display a different message. I've just put this message up, uh, where am I? Um, it prints out on the top line. And then on the second line down, so move the, the cursor down a line, and this section here will... Uh, create a little bit like a progress bar basically um, you know while you're waiting for uh, a file to download or waiting for kind of windows to install updates or whatever it is that it's doing you kind of have just a little line of dots uh, kind of progressing along the bottom of the screen just to let the user know that something's still happening and that the program hasn't hung uh, that's what we're doing here so um, we'll start off with um, a variable called uh, n and we'll set that to zero and then what we'll do is we will just add up from i to n in a loop. Uh, we'll just keep on adding dots to the end of the line. And then we'll increase n by 1. When n meets 15, we'll set n back to 0 again, and we'll loop that round. So uh, that's a little bit kind of hard to follow. But what it means is effectively to start with, you'll have 1 dot. Then you'll have 1 dot and 2 dot. Then I have 1.2.3 dot, dot, dots, then I have 1.2.3.4 dot, 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 all the way up to um, 15 dots, 
and then just as the dots would have gone off the edge of the screen they start back at zero again so it's effectively it's a simplistic little progress bar it just lets the user know that something is still happening and it's searching for a gps signal and we'll wait for a second and then we'll, we'll come around this again so it's a second in between each of those dots and then finally if we are debugging and if more than five seconds have elapsed and in that time we have not received uh, more than 10 characters from the GPS signal so basically a normal NMEA statement so a valid signal would contain more than that amount of data so if five seconds has gone past and we've not received any valid data in that time that's when if we're debugging we will send a message to the serial monitor just to say that we've not received any uh, GPS data and you know maybe we should check our wiring out um, and that's it for the Arduino code so that is my reverse geocache location based puzzle suitable for an outdoor escape room game it's not very expensive to build uh, the cost of the components on the board or in the box here is probably around $30 and the largest part of that is the battery pack and the mag lock itself. Uh, the actual GPS unit is under $5, the Arduino is $3, but I will include uh, links in the description to where you can buy one of these if you'd like to make it yourself. As always, I've tried to keep the theming very simple because I think there's lots of different ways you could theme this. Uh, this could be a dragon's egg that you need to return to its nest and when it is returned it opens up or it could be some kind of uh, radio receiver that you have to get to the optimal location where it's possible to receive a broadcast from some alien being or something. So there's loads and loads of examples of um, fun narratives that you could write this into that involve players have to go to a real world location. Now as always uh, I will put the code listing available for download along with the wiring diagram and any other additional documentation over on my Patreon page. Um, these videos I put them available on YouTube for free and you're very welcome to copy down the code and everything from this video um, but e they are supported by my amazing patrons uh, so if you would like to support me and if you feel able to support me to make more videos like this in the future uh, then please do head on over there if you don't want to or if you are unable to at the moment that's fine uh, I will carry on putting up uh, normally one video project a month like this anyway so you can always follow along with the videos uh, in the meantime if you have any questions comments or suggestions or ideas in which you could use uh, and more outdoor puzzles like this because I think this is actually a really exciting it came out of a very um, kind of hard time for many industries at the moment but particularly the entertainment industry and escape rooms but actually if it encourages innovation in new experience types that's a, a really great outcome so I'm trying to see the uh, the positive side of everything going on at the moment um, but if you can think of a way that this can be used do please let me know I always like to hear your comments and feedback and suggestions um, and if not I look forward to seeing you next video so thanks very much for watching